Hello, welcome to the Weaver Beyond the Numbers Real Estate Edition podcast. I'm Howard Altschuler, partner in charge of real estate services with Weaver. And as always, I'm joined with my tax partner, Rob Nowak. Um, the Weaver Beyond the Numbers podcast are intended for information, educational, and entertainment purposes only, and we are not here to provide accounting or tax advice. Um, should you hear something in this discussion that piques your interest and you'd like to learn more, um, please contact your tax advisor or give us a call. In fact, we'd rather you give us a call. Um, Rob, I guess there's been a lot going on in Washington the last um, couple of weeks. Um, what, what, what's your take? Well, that's a lot is probably an understatement. Someday, I think, feel like my head's going to explode from processing all the information. Um, you know, a lot out of the White House with respect to prospective changes in tax legislation. Mm -hmm. President Biden has given several speeches, which we've commented on in previous podcasts, that have an undertone of uh, providing some wide sweeping changes in tax law, increases in rates, um, elimination of certain incentives, um, elimination of what some people characterize as loopholes, all of this is going to have an effect on the real estate industry. It'll have an effect on the economy. And, and much of it is targeted to a certain extent at commercial real estate. So I, I, I agree. I keep hearing, um, reading about, I should say, people getting freaked out a little bit in the commercial real estate industry. Um, also, you know, hearing that this may have some, you know, cutting provisions, so to speak, for individuals as well. Yeah. Uh, so why don't we get into a little bit of, of the details? Yeah. So as it relates to commercial real estate, the one thing on a lot of folks' minds is potential elimination of 1031 exchanges. Mm -hmm. you know, this a is loophole. a yeah, right, yeah, right, a loophole. <laughs> <laughs> Trigger warning. Um, you know, you know, this is a provision that's been in the code for more than 100 years. So, you know, I have a tough time characterizing it as a loophole. It's just a way that the commercial real estate industry has used to defer gain on the disposition of an asset with a corresponding reinvestment of assets of similar value and similar type. The rules were changed in 2017. Prior to the tax law change in that year, um, any type of tangible property, whether it be real or personal type property, qualified for an exchange. Uh, the rules were rewritten such that only real property qualifies for an exchange now, and that's real property and interest in real property. Well, the administration is taking aim at that particular deferral opportunity. And they're looking at it in one of two ways. One is perhaps a wholesale elimination of Section 1031, which would mean no exchanges. And in another context, an elimination of the benefit for those above a certain income level, whether that be $400,000 of income or a million dollars of income. In practice, that sounds much easier to implement than it would actually be in reality, considering that you know, gains passed through from partnerships or other flow through vehicles would be very difficult to either characterize as available for deferral or not. So a lot needs to be worked out in that respect. So is this a personal issue or is this a corporate issue or both? It's both. Um, you know, a lot of CRE uh, is owned by generational family offices and that's owned through flow through structures mm -hmm. whereby that, you know, you have individuals who are eventually paying the tax or seeking the benefit of deferring the gain. Um, so it, it's really both. It's an entity as well as an individual issue. Okay. But I guess kind of the thresholds you're talking about, like 400,000 or a million, those sound more like personal type thresholds as opposed to corporate. So the Correct. jury's still Correct. out on what it would be for corporate if they try to limit it. So to speak. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, what else is out there besides 1031? So capital gain rates, um, mm -hmm. that's on the minds of the market. You know, the markets have reacted um, anytime. Uh, an administration talks about changes in capital gain rates. This goes back to the 2000s and the late 90s, as well as what we're dealing with today. Um, so the administration has proposed eliminating capital gains on taxpayers with incomes in excess of a million dollars. So, you know, the, the top 1%. So that would effectively, you know, create almost a bracketed type system, an expanded bracketed type system for capital gains, where incomes under a certain threshold would have cap gains taxed at 20%. Uh, those above a threshold would have it taxed at ordinary rates. On top of that, they're also paying tax, those who have capital gains um, 
with respect to the net investment income tax. So it's really not just an ordinary rate, it's ordinary income plus net investment income tax. So you could be pushing a capital gain rate above 43% from you know, currently what it is today with regular rate plus net investment income tax of 23%. Now in, in context and in history, um, that's you know not necessarily tragic. I mean, prior to 1986, there were no capital gain tax rates, right? And then mm -hmm. during the Reagan tax cuts, capital gain rates of 28% were imposed. Um, you know, myself, I think if I'm putting, injecting some opinion, if, if certain folks on, you know, the progressive side are seeking to increase capital gain rates, I think you increase them back to the Reagan tax cuts, which might, you know, uh, might sound better to some conservatives than raising uh, cap gain rates wholesale. Got it. So this could be a challenge for people who currently own assets. Um, it could be any type of assets, whether it's real estate, stocks, bonds, what have you. I could see where this could be really challenging for people who maybe have sold things in the last couple of years and have deferred some of those capital gains into opportunity zones where you know, they could have paid at 20% last couple of years. And now when those things come up, maybe higher, but again, maybe lower. You never know what's going to happen in eight years or so. Yeah. And you can link that back to deferred exchanges as well. You know, why would I exchange out of what might be a 20% rate year today in 2021 into what could be a 39% gain year in 2025 or 2026? It certainly is going to play, I think, with uh, deal sheets a little bit as folks look at whether or not to take advantage of 1031s or not, or even just the timing of gains. Okay. So we only have a couple of minutes. And one of the things that I said, you know, who knows what it's going to be like in eight years. Um, let's talk what's it going to be like in eight months. Do we see this as something that could be, you know, retroactive into, so to speak, into 21 or a 22 type scenario? Um, what, what, what's your thoughts? I, you know, I you can't say for sure, but yeah, you can game plan that a lot of different ways. Um, based on experience, and that's what we have to look at, you know, as a barometer for what the future might hold. The, the closer that we get to the end of 2021, the less likely it is that rate increases are retroactive. If there is going to be a retroactive increase, it could perhaps be a capital gain increase because you can cut off capital gains at a specific point in time. It's much easier to make you know, cap gains retroactive or effective as of a date within the year of passage than it is ordinary, ordinary income tax rates, right? Just because of uh, the definitive period of time when those transactions occur. The, the likelihood of whether or not all of this gets done is also on some folks' minds. I was having lunch with um, a former congressperson um, just recently, and we sort of talked about what the, the likelihood of passage would be. You know, and there is a scenario where there might be a play for time type situation where those on the right want to sort of link any tax increase of any type on any taxpayer to a midterm election. So they're going to try to push this into the next legislative session. They want to push this into 2022, okay? And, and, and have a very short period of time elapsed between the passage of a tax increase and an election to bootstrap those two events together. Whereas the progressive side probably wants to get this done sooner than later because there is a groundswell and there is momentum and they feel that they have a mandate to get it done and they want to take advantage of that. No, totally understand. So, okay. Um, any parting thoughts before we um, have to sign off? You know, the one thing that we are spending a lot of time on as a practice is, is this issue of uncertainty. And I think where accountants really um, deliver a lot of our value on the advisory side is helping clients with uh, those issues of uncertainty. We're spending a lot of time with clients and prospects right now trying to help them understand with respect to their business, not dealing in generalities, but dealing with their specific situation, okay? How some of these changes may impact their portfolio, impact their investors, impact them personally as sponsors and managers. And I would invite anybody listening, if you're interested in having us talk to you more on a very in a very specific way about your business and the impacts of some of these uncertain changes, please reach out. Howard, I know you and I would be glad to go out and talk with folks, any of our partners and anyone in our practice would be glad to speak with you, whether or not you're a client, a prospect, a referral source, anybody who wants information. Agreed. All right. Well, thanks, Rob, for the, the insights today. Um, if you're listening to this from LinkedIn, please um, like and share this uh, episode if you did like it. If you're watching it on um, our website, uh, we appreciate you doing that. As always, our podcasts are on Apple and Spotify, and you can also find them at weaver.com. 
Um, thanks for listening. Really appreciate it.